change the title up a little bit today and probably won't get too far uh, and, and I don't know how long I'll keep the title of this but I, I see a whole lot that will that will come out of it uh, I'll give you that title and this is a real spiritual title it's called what's this all about anyway <laughs> Very spiritual, Ken. Very, very spiritual. What's this all about anyway? Because these are... Uh, the, the Lord has just been... Uh, and isn't that the way we always qualify what we're going to say? The Lord told me. The Lord appeared in my room and said, Thus sayest the Lord thou God, go speakest unto thy people and tell them... Uh, God doesn't usually speak to me that way. <laughs> he says stuff to me like, you idiot. <laughs> what was you thinking? <laughs> I was using the way he speaks to me, Clyde. You big dummy. Don't you know any better? How old are you again? <laughs> yeah. I thought you were a preacher. Yeah, I thought you was a preacher. <laughs> what? Yeah. But, uh, you know, what's this all about anyway? Uh, you know, we're going we're to look at a whole lot of things in this. I mean, why do we go to church? Why do we, why do, we do what we do? And, and you know, I, I just got some stuff I've scribbled down here. I don't know what direction we're going to go, but the Lord is, uh, to me, it's like kind of stop me and just, you know, you're just kind of there, and then, then all of a sudden, all these little things that we think we know what, what's going on. I mean, what does it mean to be spiritual? Is it a hard thing? You know, we're talking about the appearing of the Lord. We talked about this little wisdom. Why is he hid? Where do I go look? I mean, you know, these are... These are questions that need to be answered. Well, did you go to church to look? If that was a place, Roger, we'd have found him a long time ago. Yeah. Where's he at? You know, I mean, the Lord said, they're going to tell you, lo here, lo there, or he's over here, over there. Don't go after him. So does that apply to the church? So if I say, if I go to Rhythms of Grace, I'm going to see the Lord. But what's the Lord saying? They're going to tell you that. But he ain't going to be there either. Now, that's hard. Though. Wait a minute. I thought we was the church of spiritual among spiritual. Where is it? Right? We're the big kahuna, you know. Is that, is that what that means? I didn't find him over here in this Methodist church, but by golly, I found him up there. Well, you're looking in the wrong place, and what you found wasn't him anyway. You found something that made you feel good for a few minutes, but was it the Lord? Heck, you can find that in a six-pack. I'm just telling you the truth. I ain't supposed to say them things, but I'm just... We just got to tell it like it is, you know. What are we looking for? Where is he found? When Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, was he lying? What does he mean when he says the kingdom of heaven is? Is it some spiritual reality that I step into and now I'm separated from you and I walk around in a bubble? My bubble busted. Burst. That's what they say at UVA. My bubble is bursted. I'm look kind of, you know, my I'm, my attention's drawn to Josh. You got to make fun of them UVA people every chance you get. Burst is a UVA word. Burst is a tech word. Oh, see? I knew there was a difference. Methodist Presbyterian right here. Methodist Presbyterian. We say busted. We busted it. I busted a tire. I, you know, I... I would just feel funny if I walked into Walmart with a flat and said, my tire bursted. <laughs> Could you please, 
<laughs> you know. Yeah. But, you, you know, I mean, most of us, we, we, we've been around church for a long time. I mean, what is it? We know how to do what it is we do. I mean, we, can, we know some things. I mean, we know the Bible is not a history book, but yet it is. Is it not? We could say, well, the Bible's not a history book, but it is a history book, but it's more than a history book. <laughs> well, the Bible's all about Christ, but you know what? Eh, yes, but there's another man involved. You know, I mean, and, that, and, and listen, it's so very easy to, to jump on and make you the, the whole center of attention and we'll just brood out arrogance. But, but that's the reason I'm saying, what is this all about anyway? You know, I, I got some terms just, just wrote down. I, I got this one statement. Is, is the Bible a history book or is it the story of God's quest for a righteous man? Is God in search of a righteous man? Well, he's got him in Christ. Then, then why the heck fool with you? I mean, you got to ask yourself the question, and every one of you knows the answer deep down in your heart. Has God ever dealt with you? Well, absolutely has. Some way, shape, or form. Some way, shape, or form, you can look back through your life and see that, well, God was dealing with me all the way back then. All the way back then when I was a little boy, a little girl, whatever, just... I will tell you what, Roger, the, the, the truth. And every one of you guys know that. You, you know, have you ever been around a dog, a big dog when you was a little kid that you thought was going to kill you? I mean, I'm just being honest with you. They used to have to walk out and catch a school bus, and our neighbors out there, they, they had two German Shepherds, Rommel, don't remember what the other one's name was, and the other neighbor had a big St. Bernard, and I'd catch that bus, and let me tell you something, I wouldn't think nothing about it. But when I got off that bus, when that big St. Bernard started barking and running towards me, I was high-telling and praying at the same time. Why didn't that dog attack me and kill me? He sure sounded like he was going to. You know what I mean? And I had to walk by this stinking dog every day, Clyde. Every day my prayer was, I hope a tractor trailer smashes your guts. <laughs> Why couldn't you buy a stinking chihuahua? <laughs> Some little dog I could kick or something. You know what I mean? But a St. Bernard and two German Shepherds I had to walk by. Now, Rommel would come and play with you, but the, but the female one wouldn't. Uh, she wasn't friendly at all. And you know a German Shepherd, when they stand there, well, see, those are just things that we're not supposed to talk about. But you know what? These are the everyday facts of life that we deal with. And, and you know, in my thinking, looking back, I think it was God who kept that dog from, from attacking me. You might think, well, no, no, no. But I'm telling you what, there was a great fear and anxiety in me every single day. When I look back at those things, now why do they come to my mind? God is faithful. God is, is merciful. Well, what about the guy who got bit by a dog? Does that mean that God was asleep? God had his back turned on him? How do we explain those things? How can I explain that the dog didn't bite me, but yet attack somebody else? You hear about it every day still yet. And, I, you know, a pit bull attacked so-and-so and bit their little girl and tore their face up. And, and you think, why does this happen? Why do I got to have a guard dog to, to start with? I would just if I wasn't scared about my thieving neighbors. I wouldn't have to have a stinking two pit bulls and a German Shepherd and electric fence and a pistol. And locks and everything else. Why? Because we're so guarded, so worried, because, and Patty mentioned something, I mentioned this the other day, this was the scripture where this all comes from, out of Revelation, I'll be to you a God and you'll be to me my people. You'll be my people. A holy priesthood. We say God. He's our God. Romans tells us there's Lord's many, there's God's many, but unto us there's just one. And we say, oh yeah, he's God, he's Jehovah, and he's everything else. And he gave you all this stuff. 
I went to church and found out I was supposed to be rich and prosperous. Found out my destiny is to be. So we gotta we gotta look, guys. We gotta we gotta look and see. We got a history book right here. But it tells us these things are written for our example. What what takes place? Why did God bless Abraham? So Abraham could live in a corner and say, ha, 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 I'm it, and you're not. God loves me, and he don't love you. That's what religion says today. You wait till God gets back and judges everybody by God, you will see. Now, I'm just telling you, that sounds kind of funny, but that's a whole religious word. Wait till Antichrist comes on scene. You better be right before comes a thief in the night. Well, he ain't coming a thief in the night to my house because I got two German shepherds, a pit bull, and a pistol. Let God try to break in my house. Just think about these things. I'll just share with you. God in quest for righteous man. What does that mean? Well, Jesus is my righteousness. But the Lord has stopped me and questioned me on everything. What does that mean, Jesus is your righteousness? Well, you know, and I go to answer, but then I just got to sit down and say, you know what, Lord, I don't got to come. First, I need to discover what righteousness is. But then how would, why even use the term righteousness? Well, what does that mean, Clyde? How does that affect me when I got to go out here and go down to the store and get gas. Who gives a hoot about righteousness when I'm pumping gas and the guy next to me is pumping gas? <coughs> this is where it's lived. I'm telling you guys, it's lived when you go to the store, it's when you go to the hospital, it's when you are out there eating biscuits, walking in the parking lot. It's at home when you're washing clothes the folding clothes, watching the ball game. I'm not saying any of those things are right or wrong, but but we gotta. It's gotta be out there. I mean, I I'm right here. Christ is my righteousness. Yes, but why? Why is He your righteousness? Who cares? What, what does it mean, Christ is your... So, so here we are, and this is where the Lord has kind of backed me up. So do we become an arrogant church too? Do we go start running around, jumping up and down and say, Christ is my righteousness. So what the heck, where's the function of it? Because if it don't have a function, what purpose is it? You know, when I'm thinking function, guys, me and my elementary UVA mind... <laughs> Josh ain't here with us a lot, so I like to really dig when I can. But I do, I think elementary, and I'm thinking, okay, I got a car, an automobile. It's got four tires on it. What's the function of those tires? You may not know what the function is. Morgan may not know what the function of those tires is until what? One's flat. She don't even pay no attention. She just gets in the vehicle and she just drives it. Yay, 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 yay. Christ is my righteousness until you get a flat and you're like, oh, now I understand the purpose of the time. I can't drive. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. So it's got to come down in its function. So what is righteousness function? You know, I, I, when I go all the way back in Genesis, I, be, I began to see something here. I began to see something throughout. Is, is Jesus made righteousness so that I can go to heaven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He paid for my sins and I could go to heaven. I got to tell you something, guys. Let me, just, let me just throw this out there at you. If I wanted, I'm God, okay? I'm God and I wanted Clyde in heaven, I'd have made Clyde in heaven. Yeah. But would you? 
I did this. Oh, but no, we got to. So now a religion steps in, and we, now we got to try. Well, no, Clyde's got to prove himself. I'm going to put Clyde down here to earth. I'm going to put him in a test probation period and see what he does. Come on, guys. Is that what you do, your own kids? If you're going to be my son, you got to prove that you're worthy to be my son. Well, we see already. Adam never did measure up with that standpoint, but I got news for you. And you, and you kind of laugh and you say, if I'd have made me a man and I wanted him in heaven, I'd have made him in heaven. Guess what he did with Adam? He made him in heaven. What do you mean? Where did he put that man? Did he not put that man right in the Garden of Eden? Did he not put his man right with him in the Garden of Eden? It's right in the first book of the Bible. Of the man he made, he formed from the dust of the ground, breathed his nostrils, the breath of life, and he put the man in the garden to do what? Dress and keep it. He put man right where the place he wanted him to start with. But man said, hell no, I don't want God, I'm out of here. <laughs> Whose fault was that? God's? Now, I know it sounds strange and it's shocking. I mean it to be shocking. Because I'm talking righteousness here because all the whole church well is righteousness and Jesus died and washed me in his blood so I could go back to heaven. Is that what he, his whole purpose was? You know, every, everything has brought into question. And I, I don't mean this as no slander or nothing on anybody or nothing towards anything. Uh, you know, a lot of these terms I've said and said and said and said over. And the whole purpose is the increase of Christ. Why? What does that mean? A whole bunch of Jesus is running around. These are all from a religious view. But what the heck does it mean? Why? Why not make a bunch of Jesuses? I mean, I mean, you know, this is just me. Why not make a bunch of Jesuses? Why not make a, make a bunch of and send them around? Why not just blow this whole world up, Kathy? You're God. You can do it. Why not send an asteroid down? I seen it in a movie, Armageddon. Why not have the drill fail and the asteroid hit? Everybody dies a nuclear winter and start again. Why not do that? Why does God care for you? Why does he care? Does he care? How does he care? What's his concern? What is he showing us in Christ? What is he promising us? Promising us? I think all through scriptures we can see the justness of God, the righteousness of God. The, the, because see, if he's going to be our God, I got to know him. I got to know what he's all about. So I, so I can gather that from here. I can know because, listen, if I'm going to serve a God, come up in here stupid and say, you know what, I'm going to serve God. Why? So I can go to heaven. Now nah, you're just wasting your time. You, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be dumb. I want you to know this man in whom you're saying you serve. And listen, does he measure up, Patty? Do you know he measures up? Because this is the things that Paul is, is telling us, Clyde. I didn't even see it. He's telling us, listen, this one you're putting your trust in, Roger, he's worthy of it. Matter of fact, he's far beyond. He's far beyond worthy of it. But listen, I want you to know it. And how are you going to know it unless I bring you into a relationship with where he can begin to prove it? Where the God that I'm serving now that I can say, here's why. Above and beyond, Paul would say, you know, that's even able to enter into your mind. Here's why. I just don't want, you know, the Lord's many and God's many, but I want to talk to you about the unknown God. You can't talk to you about the unknown God into the church. They know him. Do you? Is he the God of destiny? Is he the God of prosperity? Is he the God of healing? Is he the God of salvation? Is he the God of righteousness? Is he your God? What does it mean for salvation? Salvation mean I'm going to heaven?
If that's the case, then why not just, hey, Josh got saved and, uh, you know, three years ago, boom, beat me up, Scott, and get him out of here. Because if I leave Josh down here, there's a chance, a slim one, he may mess up again. And then his salvation is in jeopardy. And, oh, my Lord, you see what I'm talking about? So why have salvation? What is salvation? Is it something I can have? Something I can lose? Something I have at this moment? Something I need to gain? Something that's laid up for me in heaven? Why have it now? See, I've been, I know you guys are thinking, what happened to Jim? <laughs> I know you're thinking that. <clears throat> we had two weeks of cold weather, guys. I was in the house. I was in the house. Yeah, it was in the house. <laughs> my, my brain gets thinking crazy stuff, guys. I, I get silly. Believe it or not, I do. I know y'all thinking, no, Jim, he's serious all the time. I do get silly. I do poke fun. I do tell a joke every now and again. You know, what we call life. You know, we, we begin to spiritualize everything and shun everything and uh, do this and that. I mean, what do we call life? You know, people say, well, you know, I had to work yesterday. And other people would refer to it as I had to go make a living. You ever use that term? I had to go make a living. Got to make a living. Well, Paul says, Christ is my life. He liveth in me. But what does that mean? And I begin to go back and begin to see these terms. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Now, guys, listen, when I got to use this term, when I'm saying God and, and I look through the scriptures, and I, I, I'm looking, when, I, when, when the Hebrews, when they used the word God, and, uh, you know, they wouldn't even say the name. It was too uh, special, too sacred, too holy to even utter the words. And now here today, it's, uh, we just throw it around like it's nothing. But really, what does it mean? What does it mean he'll be my God? What the heck does that mean, Clyde? Why do I need a God anyway? I mean, there's an urge in us to have a God. There is, guys. If we can't find one God to worship, we'll worship Whatever we can. We feel the need to pay homage. We feel the need to pay respect. But do we know this God that we're paying respect to? And let, let me just tell you this. When I'm using this term God here, I'm calling it a term, and when I'm saying what does it mean, I'm going to throw this out there at you, and, and I'm going to say this. He's your source. Because in scriptures, it, he's the river. He's at the throne. He's the bread. He's, he's all of this. In other words, he's your source. And he says, I'm going to be your God. In other words, I'm going to be your source of all things. Not money, not your job, not your this or that or whatever. So I'm going to be. Now, when I say that, I mean now I'm asking you, is he your God? Is he your source? Well, yeah, he's my source of everything. Below me. I'm going to tell you what, guys. Just not too long ago, the Lord told Patty, he'll be made unto you all things. Now, why would he have to tell Patty that Patty already knew? Patty already knew the scriptures. We talked about it, but yet he had to go tell Patty, I'm going to be made unto you all things. Why? I'm going to tell you why, guys, because he's going to be made us, and we jump and we shout and we say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And then, then we leave here, and we go right back over that room, and we worry. Are we going to be able to pay the electric bill? I thought he was made into you all things. I thought he was your big God. I thought you want to get up and tell everybody that he's your confidence and then act like a little scary cat. So again, he's got to come and remind us and shake us up, don't he? And say, I am going to be your God, but will you be my people? Will you receive what I'm giving because I'll open up the doors of heaven? You'll not be able to receive it all. Because I'm going to be your God. Do you know me that way? Or am I the God of just, am I the God of just getting by, Roger? That's how most of us know him. That's how I was raised. He's the God of just getting by. 
He's the God of from payday to payday. So I can go make a living. Now, whoa, oh no, wait a minute. Where's Jim going? Is he talking prosperity and money and all that other stuff? See, we bring it down into that. But let me tell you something. For him to be our God is way more than paying an electric bill. It's way more. I'm talking, he delivered a nation of people who didn't have a slingshot out of the most powerful nation in the world named Egypt. And they were a bunch of stinking slaves making bricks. I know you don't think about it. You see the movies 400 years. 430 years. As long as the United States has been in existence they were making bricks for Pharaoh in Egypt. And Egypt, still yet, people line up and pay $100 a ticket to go look at Pharaoh and King Tut's tomb because of the grandeur and the glory and the gold. Still yet. And God delivered them out and killed every one of them. How? I mean, see, we don't think about that. So it's a, it's a history book, but now we want to bring it down into, we want to shrink God up and make him so little than Benny and any, and he's a God of electric bills. And I hear the Lord just kind of scolding me, Roger, and saying, you know what? I'm a little bit bigger than your electric bill. Yeah. I'm a little bit bigger than... Not sure. You know, I, I could just send a little east wind and drive a Red Sea and have my people go through on dry ground. And you know what? It's a history book, Roger. They went through on dry ground. They didn't even have any mud on their shoes. And they walked around for 40 years in their Nikes and they didn't even run out and their ankles didn't even swell and their clothes didn't go bad. And you know what? They was people dying in the wilderness, but not one of them died of sickness. Now you figure it out. Why? Because they ate manna every day. They drank water from the rock every day. I wondered if they didn't die of sickness, then what the heck did they die of? These are just questions. Because I read in the scriptures that they were whole. I mean, I've got a King James Bible. I've got several translations. I'm just giving you the one I got. So now I just have to go sit back down. You know, I'm like Job and I'm I'm walking around and I'm and then when the Lord becomes to speak in my life, I gotta go sit back down because it says, he said, the Lord comes into my life and says, Gird up the loans of your mind. Where was you, Jim? Where was you when I hung the sun and the moon and the stars? And the sons of, of the morning sun together. Where was you? Can you call Leviathan up from the depths and, and throw a little bait out there and hook him in the mouth and destroy him? Was you the one? Can you do these things? Are you the ones that holds nations in the palm of your hand as a drop in the bucket? Are you that one? I want God a little bit bigger than electric bill. Made unto you all things. What, is, what does it mean? Righteousness. We gotta, we gotta know him. To know him is what Paul said over and over. That I might know him. I know it's summed up in Christ, but why is it summed up in why is it summed up in Christ? Why why come here? Because I was a sinner. What does that mean? You know, I'm, I'm going and, and looking in the book, and I, I was reading this morning. I'm, I'm trying to think between you know Cain. Cain was the first murderer. But I, re I read after that, and I read from Cain, right after Cain, all the way down to Noah. Noah was a just man. That's what I said. Noah was a just man. So I'm saying if Noah was just, then there has to be some other sin that these people are doing. You know, he's going to go, the Lord's going to open the Bible up and I'm going to see their, their unrighteous indignation of doctrine, whoremongering, 
drunkard people. I don't read any of that. I read about they went down and they built cities and they were, uh, they knew, they learned how to do brass and they learned how to build cities and they, they built cities and, and they saw that the, the women were fair so they took women to wives and I'm thinking, what did they do that was so wrong that God said, I hate them all. It repented me that I even made them. Surely he would record in the scriptures for my learning their unrighteous deeds. I don't know about you, I thought maybe God tore some pages out, but I didn't read it quite. I studied Genesis pretty thorough. I didn't read it in it, did you? I mean, you read, I didn't read what these guys were doing, but he said, I looked at man's heart. It was only evil continually. But then it says something. Noah was a just man. I said, wait a minute, Noah was a just guy. But then it says something right before that. I'm saying, how, how was Noah a just man? The, the verse before that says, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah's adjustment. Notice how it comes. Noah found grace. Then he's just. You see what? I'm, Noah found grace. And then he's just. So I'm thinking, all right, this is good. So what does it mean about grace? How does grace affect me? So, so see, now I'm looking at direction. I'm looking at from me to God. From me to God, right? Because, listen, if I see, if I'm trying to serve a God who is full of, he's not righteous, he's full of anxiety, he's worried about every move I make, and I'm trying to please him, and it's going to be very hard for me to live. It's going to be, because the Lord brought me to this, and I, and I used to think if he's angry once, and I ticked him off, it's only a matter <coughs> before he gets angry again because I know me. And I know I'll make him mad again. But from me towards God, you see, this is why Paul is writing all these epistles. From me towards God is answered. The sacrifice, everything is answered. There's, there's rest there. Even, even the thing that, that I would bring to him, I hear him coming up and, and, I, and I, can, I can see Isaac. And I can see Abraham. And, and you know, they wasn't stupid. Abraham come out of the land of Chaldeans. What were they doing over there? People don't want to think about this, guys, but I'm just going to be honest with you. They were sacrificing to their gods. Now, let me, let me, just, let me just bring this around, guys. I'm going to throw something out at you. Is that okay? Right if I throw something out at you? Because here, here we are. Man needs to worship. Man don't know God. God's a spirit. So, so man's looking around and he sees the sun come out. And he sees how the plants and everything grows towards the sun. And he says, man, God must be like the sun. Let me worship the sun. Now you think I'm crazy, but this is where religion starts. But then he sees how the sun comes down and dries up everything and turns the leaves brown. And, and he says, I don't know about this guy. But then he sees the rain come down and, and everything springs back to life. And man, this is, this is great. And he says, maybe God is like the rain. Bring in life. Wait a minute, I thought it was like the sun. So we already got a church split, right? We got the sun, God worshipers over here. We got the rain, God worshipers over here. But then the, the rain gods, they see how the rain just keeps coming and keeps coming. And the floods come and destroy everything. And we say, man, we don't want to fool with them. So we're leaving the church of the rain god. 
But then this other church, these farmer guys come up and they look at the fertile land that's left behind and they begin to see, my God, look at this fertile Nile River Valley and they, they create Egypt because of the Nile River and the floods. So then the cows go down to, to drink the water one day and an alligator comes up out of there and he steals the cow and, and eats the cow and you say, my God, God must be like that. You see what I mean? So we create religion because we don't know God. But then he comes down to Abraham and, and, and see what, what people started doing is they started sacrificing to these gods, trying to appease them. And when, when the, those worshiping to the sun god had too much sun, they began to sacrifice because they knew God was angry. It's too much, son. It's too much. So they began to sacrifice because of them God was angry. So they began to sacrifice, but the sacrifices didn't work. So we do more sacrifices and more sacrifices. No sacrifices didn't work. So we do more and more and more. And eventually bringing their own children. That's what they did, Clyde. They brought their own children to try to appease this God. Brought him up there and cut their own son's throat to the son of God. This is where Abraham lived. I'm just telling you guys, this was the land of the Chaldeans. This is, the, this is what happened in Israel. They made their children pass through the fire. They, they offered up their own children. I mean, we see that down there because they began to even eat their own children from starvation. And we say, how terrible it was. My God, it's happening today. What, what do you mean sacrifice your own children? I would never do that. Baloney. When your concerns outweigh those of your children, you have just sacrificed them to the God of your own self. This, this, does that, do, 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 you, do you see where I'm going? So here is Abraham. Abraham grew up in this system. And now, I'm just throwing something out at you here, guys, for your speculation. So now God gives Abraham a son. I'm just, sometimes I like to throw something from a different perspective. See, we want to make everything religious. But can you see? All Abraham's ever knew was sacrifice. And now God says, now Abraham... Now I want you to be just like all the other Chaldeans. I want you to sacrifice your son. And say, finally, I got something to go off for God. God is going to be super duper happy when I get up there and cut my own son's throat. You ever just think about these things, guys? I'll just give you another perspective. Do you think God was saying... I mean, because Abraham knew this part. Because here goes Isaac and Abraham up there, and he says, you know, uh, uh, I know there's about to be a sacrifice. I see the wood. And uh, I see the fire. Uh, Dad, where's the sacrifice? Does Abraham say, you're it. He says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. You know what? If Abraham would have got that, Patty, he could have said, ha, let's wait and see. God will provide himself a sacrifice. Did, I mean, did he, ever, did he ever stop to think when he says, get you to the top of the mountain and offer your son? Well, did Abraham ever stop to think and say, oh, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. 
God. Wait, wait just a second, God. Uh, you delivered me from that land. And now you want me to do the same act as they are? Was that not a disgusting, terrible act? Guys, was not the cross a terrible, disgusting act? The act of the utmost uh, selflessness. No selfishness involved in that act. But yet, guys... Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. We'll, we'll get into all of that here later on. Jesus wanted to let them know, look, I call 12 legions of angels. My kingdom's not of this world. Got another kingdom. So now he comes and the kingdom is at hand. What does he mean? Where's his kingdom found? His kingdom was found in the cross. But listen, if we're not careful, that's what I want to go back to. Again. If we're not careful, it'll become arrogance. Let me, you see, I don't even get to any of this stuff. Now I have to come back to all this stuff. But listen, guys, that Holy Spirit, Clyde was telling me about the Holy Spirit this morning and Pentecost, but I'm going to go down to the bottom half of that chapter or in the middle of it. And I'm going to say that I've seen something this morning I had never seen. Had never thought about it. Had never considered. Because, listen, guys, I thought we're the church. See, I don't even realize my own arrogance sometimes. That Holy Spirit. He said, I'll pour that Holy Spirit out upon, upon my... Let me just go read it. My Lord and my God, I'll, I'll get this all messed up. Let me go read it. That's uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts in chapter 2. I know I've got Acts in this Bible. Yeah. And it shall come, I'm in verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, either I'm stupid or God's a liar. Which would you vote? Y'all hurt my feelings. <laughs> God has thrown you, Pastor, under the bus. And rightly so. How many people has He poured His Holy Spirit out upon? Do you, do you want to stand by that? Oh. I'm going to say you better because it's wrote right there. All flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. And, and on my servants and my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit. Well, how could so and so have the spirit? Listen to what I'm telling you, guys. And I, I just began to, to see more and more. He poured that spirit out over all flesh. That means that every person that is ever born, ever will be born, the Holy Spirit is like hovering. Just like in the book of Genesis. Hovering over them. Now, now think about what I'm telling you. That Holy Spirit over every person, whether they are in jail, whether they're here, whether they're there, whether they're in the church, or whether they're not in the church, the Holy Spirit is hovering over them, trying to move, trying to do whatever it does. The Holy Spirit, just said, we should go all the way back to creation. That's what happened to you. Now see, to some, that Holy Spirit will find entrance and will be received. And to some, their whole life will be spent in rebellion and rejection and fighting and judgment and condemnation because the Holy Spirit is right there. That's the reason he said... There'll be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. All shall come forth. And I thought, that didn't happen before, did it? And we said, some will, some will be in the resurrection to life, and some will be in the resurrection to condemnation. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself, is that resurrection. Now he hovers over everybody. Now before the Gentiles never had no condemnation. Right? Now you do. Because it's right there. 
Is he there to bring condemnation? Listen. There, there is so many scriptures and contradictions that I want to that I want to get to. Because let me tell you something, guys. We got to look at the direction. Because is there condemnation between me and God? I'm gonna tell you no. Jesus wiped that out. But. Has the Holy Spirit ever condemned you? I will have to say yes. What do you mean? Because there's been things that I've done or said or not done, or should have done, when I could just see him standing there and say, you know that wasn't right. You know that wasn't right. <clears throat> There was condemnation involved. Do we just throw that out and say that was the devil? No. See, I'm talking about direction. Where do we go with direction? Because, listen, what is this all about anyway? That's the title of it. What's this all about anyway? You got your own children right there. Is that the way you do them? Do you never, have you ever never sent your children down and said, you know, we don't take our little toy cars and hit Johnny over the head with them? Right? They're not standing there condemned before you. You still love them. But yet, in that correction, we're saying, look, you don't take other people's stuff. You share. You play with one another. You, you help one another. You, you don't push them down. You don't punch them in the eye. Now, I know you think all this is childish stuff, guys, but we, what I begin to see, guys, is we are of a kind called the human kind. And that involves everybody. So when I'm talking righteous, God is righteous and trustworthy and faithful and good and merciful to who? His old big church religious people or to all? But we ain't. We want to segregate. We do. We want to segregate. And we want to look around and say, well, I know why they got what they got. Or wait till God comes back and judges them. Or, or you know, all them kind of things. Look, I'll, I'll have to go back on this because I got so much, guys. And I don't want to take up all your time. And I'm just going through a, a little bit of stuff. And I hope if it don't do nothing, I hope it makes you question. I hope and pray it makes you question about everything. Do you know me? I wrote this down right here at, at the end. It says, I call heaven and earth to witness that the Holy Spirit, what is the Holy Spirit? Fire. Fire, right? You guys will agree with that. Fire. The Holy Spirit is fire. It's fire. Fire. <laughs> Rest upon every person alike, Jew and Gentile. Now, I'm just going to throw this out there. You talked a little bit about this wisdom. The Holy Spirit is fire. What did Moses see that made him turn aside? Did he not see fire? Did he not turn aside to see the fire? And now I'm telling you what. Where's the fire now? I just think what I just told you. I'm telling you, the fire is upon all. But yet, the bush, you, ain't consumed. But who will turn aside to go see this great sight? What do you mean? I'm looking at Josh, and now I'm seeing a fire. Wait a minute, I, I was blind and now I see men as trees. But now I see them. First I got to see the fire. Now once I begin to pay attention to the fire, I can hear the voice. Because the voice is coming out of the fire. We want to go praying over here up into heaven until God is somewhere far off. And he says, Roger, 
I'll speak to you out of the fire. Where's the fire at? Right there in Clyde. Right there in Denise. Right there in George. Oh, you mean now I'm going to have to start being involved with people? Yeah. Because that's what it's all about anyway. You want to find me? You got to know where to look. Well, that's the reason I'm going to church. Well, no. You want to find me? Go to Walmart. Because I'm right there at Walmart too. I'm walking right there and then people riding them little buggies up and down through there. I'm right there and them ones you despise and they get in front of you. Because of the way they have to check out. That's where I'm at. I'm right there in the fire. Are you going to stop and pay attention to the fire? Because I'm going to speak to you right out of the fire. Oh no, here's what I want you to do. I want thus says thou, thou shalt go up to the Rhythms of Grace Community Church on Sunday morning and thou shalt hear from God. I'm telling you to go to Walmart. Yeah. What kind of dumb preachers is he? That's why I'll never be really preaching. <laughs> we need to get us a golden plate and start passing that thing around up with you. Write notes down as soon as you get the golden plate. You see what I'm talking about? Because it's about people. I know it's all about the Lord, but where is the Lord? I'll be to you a God, you'll be to, my, to me my people. He said, I'm going to make you a, a what? A holy what? Priesthood. What does priests do? Priests minister. Who do they minister to? To God. If I want to minister to God, i got to minister to Him where He's at. right there in you. It's about people. I wondered what they did. Why, why did God say, I have, it repented me that I made man. I'm just going to break this down to you. Real simple. They became selfish. They became selfish. They became concerned with their <clears throat> own self. And only one, Noah, became concerned with somebody else. And see, what does religion do? Why did God hate the Pharisees? Were the Pharisees big, eagle, big evil, adulterous people running around hunting women and going to bars and doing all the things we quote as evil? No. They became selfish. They become, it's all about us. And become arrogant. It's so easy in the church world to come and become arrogant and not realize, God, let me tell you where the kingdom of heaven is found. It's found in your acts of kindness. That's too simple, Aunt Roger. It's too simple. It's got to be something more extraordinary than that. My God, what did Jesus do? Make everybody rich and prosperous or did he go around and lay hands on them? Did he come and eat supper with them? Did he just go into their homes and say, salvation has come to your house today? Why? Because here I am, the king of glory. I'm going to sit down at your table and eat. Can you imagine that? The king of glory come to your home and he ate your soup, beans, and cornbread. You didn't have to lay out no filet mignon and cabernet and all this other stuff. He came and ate your soup, beans, and cornbread and your ham hocks in your greens. See, see it's just too simple. I'm going I'm to tell you this. I wondered a long time. Talk about the candle of the Lord. Candle of the Lord. The church is a candle. Well, I always had a candle. I have candles all over my house. I have candles. There was something that always puzzled me. And I asked great scholars, even rabbis who studied the Talmud, and I said, there's something about this candle that you guys never talk about, and I want to know about it. And they said, what? Do you want to know about the oil or the makeup of the candle and, and its flame and its beauty and how the oil flows and the fire and its brightness? And I said, I want to know about the wick. They said, we never studied the wick. We don't know about the wick. I said, well, did you and your greatness tell me how a candle can burn without a wick? Got to have a wick, Clyde. <laughs> I can have a big bowl of smelly wax. I just got a big bowl of smelly wax. Got to have a wick. Finally, I found this guy. And he says, the human body is the wick. 
and the flame was above it. And he gave me the scripture in Ecclesiastes, let thy head, which is Christ, lack no ointment, which is the oil. Pull the candle. And what was that oil? What was that anointment that he had? Everybody wants the anointment. The anointment was for his death. And what is that death? So that my concern is not about me anymore. My concern is about you. That was the whole thing, Clyde. That was the whole thing that it was all about. I, so much, guys, but I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do here. I asked Clyde if he would to come and share a little story with you. Because he told me that story, man, it just, it just it rocked my world. And listen, guys, I will tell you this. It, if you guys got stuff that you need to share, then share it with us. Don't keep us, don't be selfish. What you might think is an embarrassing story may be bread to our souls. You know? I mean, it really may be because I know the Lord is great and merciful and loving kindness. And He has dealt with me in, in ways and guys... This ain't about me being a big time preacher standing up on the stage and doing all this other stuff. It's, it's us, guys. It's us. And not only that, it goes out into others. And man, we gotta share. So when I say all this, we that's what it's gonna be about, guys. What's this all about anyway? We're gonna see. So I'm gonna let Clyde come and share his. You want a mic, Clyde? Where's your mic at, Pat? Right here. She's. <coughs> you want to use that one? Everybody stay in front of Okay. When that gentleman asked me to do this, I was shocked. I said, what's this got to do with a message? Jim calls it the bicycle story. Yeah, bicycle story. And uh, this happened uh, several years ago. My brother worked in the mines and... Um, Right above the mines was a little holler, and back up in the holler, he had a camper. And he uh, would hunt from that camper. And um, stayed up there a lot. He went up through there one day in the summertime. He kept a lot of things up there. He kept his four-wheeler, some of his guns and bows and stuff. And uh, at the head of the holler there was a little trailer, single-wide trailer, and there was four or five kids would run around there and half naked through the summer and they'd wave at him as he went by in his big old truck and one day he stopped by and the lady was out hanging up clothes and he said ma'am he said um, he was getting close to the fall of the year and he said I wonder if it'd be okay if I'd buy your kids something for Christmas and she said uh, sure she said that'd be okay and uh, he said, if you would, write down a list of things that they want and uh, things that they need. And so uh, she did that, and uh, he told some of us about it, and he took up a little collection, and he had come into some money, and he wanted a bicycle. So uh, my brother went to Walmart and uh, got a hold of the manager, and he said, you know, he said, I, I'd like to get a bicycle, but I don't know what size. I've got a kid here. It's about 18 years old. He said, it's been so long since I've had kids. said, I don't know what size. And the manager said, go back there, the toy department. We've got a young man working back there, and he can help you. My brother went back there, and um, there's this young man there, and my brother told him what he was doing. And that young man looked at him and said, you don't know me, do you? And my brother said, no. He said, you and your family did this for my family when I was a young boy. And it brought tears in my brother's eyes. And they, they bought toys and took it to the family. And, and of course, you know, it was a tear-jerking time. And there's another twist to this story. Um, that family moved out of that holler. And... Uh, my brother was at work one day and the guy said, do you still have that camper up in the head of the holler? And my brother said, yes, I do. 
he said, well, he said, in that last trailer, a man moved in there that's on drugs and said he'll steal everything that he put his hands to. He said, so if I were you and I had anything up there, I would take it home. My brother had his four-wheeler and his bow and guns and things. And he got thinking about it. He said, yeah, I need to do that. So one day he got off work, went up in the holler, and as he drove by that little old trailer, there was a man standing out in the yard, and he waved my brother to stop. And my brother stopped, and he said, are you the one that's got the camper up in the head of the holler? And my brother said, yes, I do. He said, well, I want you to know something. He said, the people that lived here, the lady that lived here and her husband said, the lady was my sister. And she told me what you done for them for Christmas. He said, I've been keeping an eye on your camper to make sure nobody touches anything up there. Church to start buying bicycles. <laughs> About time for us to start buying bicycles. You know? 